Well, uh, I am going to talk about interactive simulations for climate change policy. And this is work I've done jointly with my colleagues at Climate Interactive. Elke Weber gave a great talk this morning that laid out the foundation for what we're trying to do. And she phrased it this way, climate change is a perfect storm of public confusion, right? The complexity, the low signal and noise ratio, we can't run experiments, we can't learn from experience. By the time we do, it'll be too late. There's a global problem here of tragedy of the commons. And on the more behavioral side, people don't understand the scientific concepts, the terminology, the units of measure, like parts per million, parts per billion, gigatons of CO2 equivalent emissions per year, watts per meter squared of radiative forcing, and for Americans, degrees Celsius. <laughs> More important, it's strongly conditioned by ideology. There's powerful vested interests that are working aggressively to confuse the public and discredit the science. And uh, there's strong emotions evoked when you talk about this, including fear, anger, denial, helplessness, and despair. Small wonder, then, that any time a scientist or anybody else stands up and tries to tell you about climate change, you react like this. So what we have been doing is trying to create opportunities for people to learn for themselves about how the climate works, that rigorously based on the science, but in which they control the learning, they can ask the questions, they can make the assumptions. And to do that, we've developed a suite of interactive simulation models, uh, C-ROADS, Climate uh, Rapid Overview and Decision Support, and N-ROADS, Energy Rapid Overview and Decision Support, are two of the primary ones. There's an iPhone app and there's others, but those are the two primary ones. So these are being used by policymakers, and you see some of them here. Uh, so Secretary Kerry and Secretary Moniz have personally used the model, as has Christiana Figueres, the Secretary of the UNFCCC, Todd Stern's office in the State Department. He's a special envoy for climate change. They use it. The Chinese use it. It's in Brazil and other places. But more important than that, we try to get it out there to the public. So although it's wonderful when Secretary Kerry says, I've used the model, it's great, we like it, we use it, uh, if, if there was a perfect agreement in Paris this winter, it would mean nothing unless there's broad enough public support for the enabling legislation and regulations to be enacted. So I'm going to gloss all the details about how the model works and how it's been tested and validated and peer reviewed. And instead, let's together spend a couple seconds and see if we can save the climate. Uh, so here is one of the models. And let me run it. And what you see is business as usual, in which we blow through the 2 degrees C target by mid-century and end up at around 4 degrees Celsius uh, by the year 2100. And it's still rising. Uh, and that would lead to a variety of potentially catastrophic outcomes. On the left here, you see the energy sources, oil in red, black is coal, green is renewables, blue is natural gas, pink is nuclear. And now the challenge is, how do we solve this problem? How do we get the temperature rise down below 2 degrees? What would you like to do? So this, I'm a, pro a professor in a management school. We're going to cold call here. Sir, what would you like to do? Uh, keep the uh, energy companies out of Paris. <laughs> OK, so. Great, so reduce the influence of the fossil fuel industries. And if we could do that, what would happen? What, what policies could we enact? What would you like to do policy-wise? Uh, uh, trade and cap. Cap and trade, so put a price on carbon emissions. Great, well right here we have an emissions price, the user fee for carbon. It's actually negative right now, but let's, let's increase that. And you know, how about in the mid? Uh, 60s. That's close to the United States federal government's social cost of carbon. And you can see it definitely has a substantial impact, but it does not solve the problem. Uh, it lowers the expected warming by you know, less than a degree, and we still blow through the target at around the same time. So that's very useful, and you can see it's suppressed coal. Not enough. What else should we do? What would you like to do? Great. So here's renewables. We can subsidize them over and above the uh, carbon price. Uh, $8 per gigajoule is a fairly substantial subsidy. And you can see the green line is now much, much higher. And we have made a tiny little bit of difference over here. We've suppressed coal. We've lowered oil and gas. We've got a lot more renewables. But we haven't solved the problem. Now, one of the things that you can do, and we don't have time to really dig in here, is you can ask why. 
And one thing that's going on here, as you might expect, is with much, much cheaper energy overall, you have both direct and indirect rebound effects, because people have more money in their pocket. They use more energy, take their family to Disney World with the savings, and uh, their energy use goes up. And that offsets the benefit. And although we don't have time for you to discover that on your own today, that's what the model is good for. People have the chance to say, hey, that's puzzling. How come this isn't working? And then dig in and find out why. Well, so what else can we do? Time is short. Let me suggest a couple other things we might do. Let's see if we can put a price over and above the carbon tax on coal. It's very damaging on a wide range of environmental issues, not just the CO2 emissions. Well, that's helping a little bit. What about natural gas as a bridge fuel? Well, this one's tricky. If we uh, assume that, say, fracking is now licensed worldwide and uh, it dramatically lowers the cost of natural gas, the blue line of natural gas does rise and almost nothing happens. And in fact, there's two reasons for this. Although it suppresses coal and oil because they have more carbon per joule, it also suppresses renewables. And that harms the low carbon future we're trying to build. And since renewables are at the beginning of their experience curves and scale economy dynamics, you're slowing down the renewables not only today, but in the future cumulatively. So that's not very helpful. Let me put that back. We could reduce methane leakage. That's very helpful. Uh, we can reduce other gases besides CO2, the methane, the N2O, the uh, perfluorocarbons, the other sulfur hexafluoride and other fluorine gases. That helps. Uh, we can do some deforestation reduction. Uh, we can have a little bit of carbon capture and sequestration. And in that fashion, people can begin to construct that silver buckshot world in which there's no one magic bullet, but there is a set of silver buckshot that might get us where we want to go. Now, time is short. This isn't really the way you use the model. But in this fashion, people from the senior policymakers to high school students all around the world are having the chance to use the model interactively on their own and discover how the climate works for themselves. And uh, I can tell you a little bit about how this works. It's being used all over the world. You see some photos here of people running workshops where they use the model in a workshop format simulating the UNFCCC negotiation process. And what we do is we divide people into different delegations representing the United States, India, China, EU, et cetera. And uh, to make it real, one of the things that I do is I have all the people representing the developing nations of the world come into the room. There's no food on their tables. There's a lot of wonderful, rich food uh, on the tables for the United States, the EU, and the other rich countries. And then I make them sit on the floor. And that induces a great deal of real grievances among the participants. So when they do their face-to-face -face negotiation, it's not, oh, let's all hold hands and sing kumbaya. When sea level rises, we cover them up with a sheet. And then they start to become climate refugees. So let me wrap up real quickly. This is all freely available. It's fully documented. We have a radical transparency approach here. Every equation is out there for you to examine. There's peer-reviewed publications where you can look at the models and decide for yourself whether they're, uh, whether they're good or not. And we are trying to encourage people, whether they're academics, teachers, public policy, to learn how to use the models. We have a free workshop coming up in July that I'd love to invite you to come and experience. And if you have further questions, contact me or go to climateinteractive.org. Thanks very much.